In Gen 9, the hail weather condition was changed over to snow, and it came with a great buff to ice types. Snow no longer does chip damage every turn, but instead boosts the defense of all ice type Pokemon by 50%. The new ice type on the block, Satitan, is also able to take advantage of the snow with its slush rush ability, which doubles its speed under snow. Satitan is a crazy tank with its base 170 HP, solid 113 attack, and respectable 73 speed that gets a lot of help from its ability. It also gets access to Belly Drum, which maximizes attack, and then can outrun basically anything in the snow while taking attacks. Ladies and gentlemen, grab your jackets. Snow is in the forecast because I have an absolutely insane snow-based team. And if you're into that kind of thing, consider hitting that subscribe button. I'm on my way to 300k. It's free. It only takes you a second, and I promise you will not regret it. Let's go ahead and jump into the match. All right, so my opponent is going to go ahead and lead off with the Sneasler. Now, important to note, Buddy's whole team is honestly pretty broken, full of some absolute threats, with the Sneasler probably honestly being the most broken of them all. But... I decided to lead off with the old Frosted Mini Wheat, and we want to get that snow up as early as possible. So, here's the thing. I'm pretty certain the Sneasler is going to go for a fake out here. That's going to activate the uh, normal gem, and that is then going to activate its ability Unburden once it uses up the item. So, an already insanely fast Sneasler with its speed doubled is going to be faster even than my Slush Rush. So, I decided to go into the Arcanine. Now, I'm actually going to be Flash Fire over Intimidate. I try to cover for the fire weakness on this team, um, but I know that I can take two attacks here. Uh, the fake out doesn't do much. And then I have an option on whether I want to go for damage or go for the Will-O-Wisp. I decide to go for the Will-O-Wisp as they actually end up hitting me with a Dire Claw. And they, of course, are going to actually get that poison. So, Barkley is now poisoned. I do luckily land the Will-O-Wisp. And while I could have likely just gone for a combo of, like, Flare Blitz plus Extreme Speed, I'm thinking with this thing burnt, it's actually pretty good uh, as an opportunity for me to try to set up one of my Pokemon in the back. So, I'm hurt by my poison. Arcanine does not have a whole lot of utility here. They don't have... Uh, fire options to switch into and I'm just gonna end up going for the extreme speed get a little bit of chip damage before I go down um, And that is going to knock this thing to about half so Sneezer's over here with his crazy ass Wolverine claws Just throwing dire claws all willy-nilly and down goes goes Clifford the big yellow dog So while this thing is still extremely fast because of its speed doubling due to that unburden ability It's now not gonna have the firepower to like knock me out So what I decide to do is bring in some cold cuts now Alolan Sandslash is going to find himself in a situation where this thing is still going to be faster and it does have the four times super effective close combat coverage. So what I decide to do is I'm going to commit the Terra, go for that Terra Water which is going to effectively you know, make close combat neutral and then I can take this opportunity to set up a Swords Dance. So we're playing the long game a bit here and that once I get through the Sneasler, uh, the Alolan Sandslash is faster than the entire team and then with plus two from the Swords Dance, we're going to be pretty solid. So they do go for that close combat. And even with the burn, that shit is definitely going to hurt. But they get the defense drops, and now I figure I'm not feeling sharp enough. I go for that Swords Dance, and now, now we're actually actually ready for some cold cuts. So with the Bomba Snow being Icy Rock, the snow should stay around long enough to allow Alolan Sandslash to make a pretty solid dent in the team here. So all I have to do now is take another attack. I can then finish this thing off with an Earthquake and Profit. They do go for the Dire Claw, no longer being Steel-type anymore. And this is exactly why all my homies hate Sneasler. They do get the Para with the Dire Claw, which is kind of hilarious. But I'm able to finish them off with an Earthquake, and that's just really annoying because now the Para is going to half my speed, and Sand Slash isn't going to be able to do, you know, really the full potential of what homie was ready to do. Now I'm just sitting over here looking like a damn fool with a fountain on my head for absolutely no reason. But now they get a free switch into whatever they like, and in comes... The old teapot, who seems to be floating like six feet in the air for some reason, and we all know what's coming. This thing's a one-trick teapot in that it always goes for Shell Smash, which it is going to go for there, and I figure they're probably going to be Focus Sash at this point, and I really need to break through the Para uh, just to knock it to that Sash. So, Sand Slash likely would have gone in Fallen Short on the sweep anyway, but I do break through, I get the Iron Head off, and they do live with that Sash. So, the problem here is now... Since I touch it, it does actually also activate its weak armor, it has a shell smash boost, and its speed is actually pretty damn insane at this point. So, I essentially don't have an option to really switch into anything here, and I kind of just have to let Sand Slash go down. So, they do finish me with the Giga Drain, and down goes the Sand Slash and the Terra with it. So, Giga Drain gives them, you know, a little bit of, little bit of cold cuts on the way out, and I now have to figure out a way to get through... Shell Smash. Any Pokemon with access to that is just so annoying to deal with, and I don't have any priority left, seeing as my only priority here is Arcanine with Extreme Speed, who couldn't touch it anyway, but what I do have is the damn Spirit of Christmas on my side, baby. I bring in the Delibird, and 
I'm actually focus ashed myself. I figured, hey, if you want to play this ash game, I'm gonna play it right back at you. They do go for the shadow ball here. I take it right to the old bag and <laughs> I'm able to live with the focus ash. And now it's time for Delibird to Amazon Prime deliver these hands next day. I go for that freeze dry and that does finish off the tea. So no longer do we have to worry about being swept by a broken ass teapot. And also Delibird got himself a kill. So, you know, we love to see it. The snow does go away. So the spirit of Christmas is fading as now they get a free switch into whatever they like and they actually decide to go into Alolan Ninetales. Now, this thing actually just sets up the snow for me, which is actually kind of great. A lot of people use Alolan Ninetales because of its ability uh, to set up that Aurora Veil, but in my situation here, it's actually nice because I get some free snow out of it. So, at this point, I don't really have an option to switch in here. I know that it's just going to go for Aurora Veil. Talk about another Pokemon that pretty much just does the same thing always. Uh, I also cannot Destiny Bond because this thing is faster. And I find myself in a spot where at least Delibird can give you one last little little stocking stuffer for that ass. He does go for the Aurora Veil, of course, and now I have to worry about that sticking around. With the Light Clay, it's going to be around for like eight turns. So that's annoying, but I do, you know, scatter a little bit of Legos on their side of the field. And uh, hopefully they wake up on Christmas morning and immediately stub their toes on the way to the Christmas tree. So I still don't really have the safest switch option. I just decide... I'm actually just going to stay in here with the Deli Bird and just go for another layer of spikes as they finish me with that chilling water, which is fine. It, you know, Deli Bird didn't have the ability to outspeed anything left anyway, and at least I got my spikes up. And the Focus Ash came in clutch. So now I get a free switch into whatever I want, and I decide to go into the Galarian Slowking. The reason is I can force this thing out with the threat of like a Sludge Bomb. Knowing that they can't really hit me that hard in return, I can try to make a play here and grab some momentum. So. I'm going to go for that chilly reception. What that's going to do is go for the switch, as I imagine they probably switch into the Great Tusk. However, they instead just stay in and go for the attack, as now I try to tell my joke and it just straight up fails, but it does actually still allow you to switch. Now, the reason why that's fine is because, as you can see with that regenerator ability, I, I'm pretty much net even on the whole thing there. So I figure it's worth it for the payoff if they do switch, but also since they didn't, it's fine. There's just still burning turns of that Aurora Veil. Uh, so now this allows me a nice little switch back into the Obama Snow, and as they go for the Blizzard here, I'm able to just set up my own Aurora Veil. I figure, hey, I copied you on the Focus Sash, I'm gonna copy you on the Aurora Veil, and that is fine. So, since they are staggered, um, we actually do have the upper hand, however, I'm actually Icy Rock over Light Clay, so... In, I believe, five turns, both of our Aurora Veils are going to go away. So, at this point, I'm just going to switch right back into the Galarian Slowking. And behind the Aurora Veil, we're actually feeling much better about this situation. So, they go for that Blizzard. It's not going to do a whole lot of damage. The snow does go away, which isn't really a huge deal at this point. And after Leftover Recovery, I'm definitely feeling like I win this one-on-one. -on -one. So, I'm thinking there's no real reason for them to stay in here. A Sludge Bomb still does pretty decent damage to them, even behind the Aurora Veil. So I'm thinking I could definitely try to go for that Chili Reception again and make a play. They have three Pokemon left at this point other than the Ninetales, but they actually end up staying in. They go for the Moon Blast, which literally does nothing. And I tell my joke again. I'm like, damn, can I get a different audience out here? For Christ's sake, nobody, nobody's appreciating my jokes for real. It does make it snow though, which is actually pretty nice. And that is going to allow me another switch. So since I'm able to set up the snow, I figure... Now is actually my best opportunity to try to set up Big Bertha. We are fast as hell under the snow, we have the Aurora Veil behind us, and we're feeling, we're feeling pretty good at this point. So good that I'm just going to go right for that Belly Drum and get my attack right to plus 6. And even if they do have something like the Freeze Dryer or whatever, behind that Aurora Veil, I know that I can take an attack. Because we also be taking that snack. I have the Citrus Berry here, and that's going to give us a nice little chunk of HP back. Meanwhile, Buddy's actually going to go for the Aurora Veil again. They must have lost track of how many turns were left, and that's going to fail. doesn't really matter, because while it does go away next turn, um, they weren't going to be able to knock me out regardless. So now I can just go for a Liquidation, and I am, of course, about fast as hell in the snow here. It is going to do around half, even with the Aurora Veil there at plus six, as they then fire off a nice little Chilling Water, which does drop my attack one stage, but I'm still literally here at plus five, and I don't give a shit. So... Both of our Aurora Veils are now gone, and Satitan is set up under the snow for a few more turns. So I can go for Liquidation here. He's going to take care of the Ninetales. Most annoying Pokemon that literally everybody is using these days, and you love to see it gone, and no longer the ability for them to set up the, the Aurora Veil. So now they get a free switch, and they decide to go into the Palafin. So Palafin is coming in as regular cute ass form, where he's not quite a hero yet. So I'm actually just going to go for the Earthquake here, and at plus five, 
it should definitely still knock it out. But they have to essentially go into the Palafin and then immediately switch so that way when it comes back in, it's going to be in its full form. And this is going to allow Mew to come in and just gets absolutely obliterated by an Earthquake. They were in a situation there where pretty much something has to take an attack, so Mew goes down as the fodder, and sadly the snow is going to go away. Since it was set up from the chili reception, it only lasted 5 turns. Um, but I'm still sitting here at plus 5 attack, and in comes the Palafin. So I don't have the option to use my Terra at this point, and I'm worried that uh, they're going to be able to knock me out here. So to cover for that, what I'm going to do is hard switch directly into Obama Snow, and even though I get absolutely bopped by like a drain punch from Superman Dolphin over here, I am going to be able to set back up the snow. So that's of course going to make it so now when Satitan comes back in, he's going to have that doubled speed and be able to outspeed everything they've got. And the Palafin is actually going to go ahead and commit the Terra here. Now, they go for the Terra flying, I assume because they want to dodge an Earthquake, but also it is going to be able to boost the damage of their Acrobatics, as that's what they're going to go for. And Obama Snow just gets absolutely cut the hell up from that. And uh, he is part of a balanced breakfast, however, yeah, we ain't, we ain't living that. So, down goes Obama Snow, but I did what I needed it to do in that I was able to set up the snow once again, because now, Birth is actually able to come in, and they kind of did me a favor in that they went for that Terra Flying, because now I have a super effective Ice Glow Crash, and I can outrun this thing. They do go for the Jet Punch with the priority, but listen, I'm a, have you seen the size of Bertha? She's she thick as store by Gravy, I'm able to finish it off with an Icicle Crash, and now they are down to one Pokemon left. And that is going to be, again, an annoying Pokemon in the Great Tusk. So, I don't have my Belly Drum at this point, and that means I don't have enough damage to quite knock this thing out with one Icicle Crash. I do have the speed to be able to get some damage here, so I figure with my only Pokemon left being the Slowking, all I can really do is go for the Icicle Crash. And judging off of this damage, that is definitely a defensive Great Tusk, which is actually going to end up being pretty solid news for me because there is a solid chance that even with an Earthquake, my Slowking does have a solid chance to live. So I have one Pokemon left and a Dream, and an Ice Beam should be enough to knock this thing out if I can get the attack off. Now, of course, I'm about slow as hell out here, and the Great Tusk is going to be able to outspeed. So it all comes down to the final move where I go for the Ice Beam, they do commit the Earthquake, and as you're going to see, Galarian Slowking is the absolute GOAT. We're able to live it with just a few HP, fire off an Ice Beam in return, and down goes the Great Tusk. That was actually an insane ending. It was actually, it was pretty lucky that that thing wasn't max attack, uh, which did allow us to live it. So that is going to be the end of the match, and I thought that that was just a super fun one. It came right down to it, of course. And uh, thank you guys again for watching. Make sure to leave a like on the video if you haven't already. And I will catch you guys next time. Peace out.